Hi, everyone. Welcome. On behalf of the League of American Bicyclists and Daryl, I want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Amelia Neptune. I'm with the League of American Bicyclists. And um, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, we are recording the session, and everybody who registered should get a copy of the recording afterwards, so keep an eye out for that. And um, we will have time for Q&A, but you can type your questions into the chat box at any time during the session, and um, we'll be answering questions towards the end. So please feel free to type in your questions as they come up, um, and if we aren't able to get to them today, we'll, we'll try to follow up with anybody with um, unanswered questions at the end. Um, so with that, I will kick it off, and Luke, can you, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to give a couple quick intro slides about um, why the League um, is um, partnering to, to host this, co-host this webinar today, um, and, and why bike parking is so important to us. So just in case you're not familiar with us, the League of American Bicyclists is a national nonprofit bike advocacy organization. Um, we've been around since 1880, and our mission today is to lead the movement to create a bicycle-friendly America for everyone. Next slide. And through a number of programs, um, including our Smart Cycling program that trains and certifies league cycling instructors to teach bike safety in their communities. We host the National Bike Summit. Um, we do a lot of reports to support local and statewide bike advocacy, and we do federal bike uh, advocacy at, uh, here in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill. Um, you'll see an action alert is on our website right now. So if you um, are able to reach out to your Congress members to make sure that um, you know, the, the latest bills include um, funding for biking. Please check out that on our website. Uh, next slide. And the program that I run is the Bicycle Friendly America program, which evaluates states, communities, businesses, and universities um, for being bicycle friendly. Um, next slide. And there might be a little bit of a delay. So. Sorry, folks, if my slides and my talking points aren't matched up, <laughs> you can go ahead to um the next one lou um so the bicycle friendly america suite of programs um, for communities businesses and universities um is an opt-in program so you have to apply for the recognition um and not everybody that applies gets an award from us um, but we do give out awards bronze through platinum um, but everybody give, gets um, feedback from us on how to improve and um, over the years, we've seen that the criteria that it takes to become a bicycle-friendly community um, really is a proven strategy. Um, communities that are BFCs have much higher ridership and better health outcomes than non-BFCs. Um, and that's one of the reasons we're so excited to be partnering with the CDC now through their Active People Healthy Nation initiative, which is an effort to get 27 million Americans to become more active by the year 2027. Um, and um, the BFC program is um, fits in really well with this initiative to create activity-friendly routes to everyday destinations. And um, bike parking especially is a really important part of that, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Next slide. Um, so the criteria for the Bicycle Friendly America application are uh, what we call the five E's of engineering, encouragement, education, evaluation, and planning, and then equity, diversity, and inclusion is the very essential lens that um, you must look at all the other E's through um, in order to really create a bicycle-friendly America for everyone. Next slide. And uh, secure bike parking is a really essential part of the engineering E. Um, and it's one of the reasons we've been so excited and proud to partner with Zero for many years. They're a great supporter and partner for the Bicycle Friendly Business Program, and they're a platinum level BFB themselves. Um, but we point to the um, APBP bike parking guides in our applications, and we actually send one of these pocket bike parking guides from Zero to every single um, BFB awardee because they are a really great resource that reinforces the APBP guidelines um, and showing people what great bike parking looks like. So I'm excited for you to hear directly from them today. Um, next slide. But I wanted to share a little bit about what we look for in the Bicycle Friendly America applications in terms of what good bike parking looks like um, to, to help communities and businesses and universities earn awards. And especially today in talking about long-term bike parking for workplaces and campuses. Um, and a really important thing I want everyone to know is that, you know, there's no one size fits all equation for what every single bicycle friendly business must look like or what every single long term bike parking room um, is going to look like. So for some places, it's, you know, outdoor um, bike lockers. For some places, it's double decker bike parking. For some places, if you're an ambulance provider, you're hoisting the bikes above the ambulances in the uh, garage. So 
you know, there's a lot of different things that good bike parking could look like. Um, and that's, that's an important component of the BFB program is sort of meeting all these different types of businesses and employers and campuses where they are um, and figuring out what's going to work for them. Next slide. Um, and that's also a really important um, point to reinforce the equity component of the Bicycle Friendly America criteria. And what it's all about is um, meeting people where they are and, and um, addressing barriers, recognizing that not everyone has the same barrier and not every um, solution is going to be the right solution for different people. So figuring out um, what the barriers that your specific employees or students are facing and um, addressing those barriers. Uh, next slide. So when it comes to bike parking, um, you know, not just thinking about the racks, but all the other things that go along with your bike parking, including your end of trip facilities. So, you know, making sure there are tools and supplies for people to do quick bike repairs if they need to before they head home. If you have something like showers or lockers or a changing facility, making sure that's easily accessible from the bike parking room. Um, we've heard from businesses where they have really awesome bike parking and really awesome showers and lockers, but they're on opposite ends of the office and people are too embarrassed to walk from one end to the other in their sweaty clothes and so they just weren't getting used. So, you know, putting a lot of thought into how these things fit together. Um, next slide. Um, and then also the other kinds of resources that you can include in your bike room from bike maps to bike education to encouragement tools, data collection tools, fun charts that um, record, let people record their miles and celebrate every ride that they take, sharing information about local bike events or rides or classes that are happening in the community that the local advocacy group is offering. Um, so using this space to not just provide bike parking, but also to help build your bike culture in your um, business or your workplace. Next slide. And then again, I'll, I'll reinforce the accessibility component, how important um, that equity consideration is in realizing that not everybody has the same barriers. So, um, you know, not expecting everybody to have to open a very heavy door or lift a very heavy bike and making sure your bike parking can accommodate, um, you know, through things like ramps and automated, um, automatic opening doors, um, elevators, you know, these, these things seem kind of simple and basic, but it's not always considered when people are planning out bike rooms and they are so important. Um, another thing I really like to point out is wayfinding signage is so important if you've got a big campus or a big office building and people might not know where their bike parking is. If you're a business that's customer focused, making sure your bike parking information is front and center on your website, on your, you know, about us or contact us page so that people know when they're deciding how to get to your business that they can arrive by bike and they'll know their bike is going to be, you know, safe and secure while they're at your business. Um, next slide. Um, so finally, just a few links for anybody who's curious to learn more about the Bicycle Friendly America programs. And if you want to apply for Bicycle Friendly Business or University, we have two deadlines coming up next month. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Lou and Travis to get to the meat of the webinar today about um, all the great things they have to share about uh, long-term bike parking. So thanks so much, Lou. Hi. Uh, thanks, Amelia. Appreciate it. Uh, and you did a great overview, really. Uh, we're going to actually talk a lot about this, a lot of the same things you talked about and just maybe go into a little more detail in the things that we feel uh, should have some detail. But it's, in these types of presentations, it's always good to hear uh, some things repeated just for a good reminder. So just a good sense of what we'll be talking about today. We're going to start with basics. I've done enough webinars now that I know attendees come from all different places. And so sometimes we miss some basic things and maybe sometimes we get too much into the weeds and other things. So we'll really try to have a balanced presentation. So we're gonna start at the very fundamental, what makes a good bike rack? And then we're gonna get into key elements of excellent long-term bike parking facilities, uh, talk a little bit about common pitfalls, and then delve a little bit into uh, proper layouts for bike rooms. And I'm, I'm so pleased to have uh, Travis even with me. Uh, he's a longtime employee there on just really has uh, so familiar with uh, the bike parking landscape. Uh, he makes me feel, um, I've been at it a long time, and <laughs> it makes me feel like a rookie. So uh, between him and I, we should be able to uh, carry you along this path uh, and, and help you create some uh, great bike uh, parking facilities for yourselves and for your organizations. So for starters, if we talk about short-term and long-term bike parking, um, that's really the foundation of what this presentation is about. 
we're going to talk about long-term bike parking. And if we go by APBP, which has really become the standard, the American uh, uh, the Association for Bicycle and Pedestrian Professionals, uh, long-term bike parking is really anything more than two hours. That could be meetings, that could be, you know, extended classes, uh, that could be for a day, you know, for a, a whole day at the job. Um, and so anything for two hours. We really, when we're thinking about long-term bike parking, uh, there's, there's, a, there's considerations between short-term and long-term bike parking, but the main thing with long-term bike parking is people will walk the extra mile if their bike parking can be covered that's really important for long-term bike parking. Whereas if it's a short-term trip, people won't be as concerned if, the, if they're sheltered, you know, but for long-term trips, they'll go out of the way a little bit to make sure their bike is covered. And then security, that there's extra security measures other than just eyes on the street. Maybe there's a key fob or maybe there's um, some lock or some security camera, something is going to make that particular space more secure than just your typical bike rack on the street. And those are some of the real, those are the things we emphasize on long-term bike parking. So what makes a good bike rack in any scenario, whether it's short-term or long-term uh, bike parking? Well, the stability of the rack is at the foundation. That rack has to be firmly anchored into the ground. And if you've been around long enough, you know that plenty of bike racks aren't firmly anchored to the ground for whatever reasons. There's a lot of wiggle, a lot of movement, uh, sometimes they're not even anchored into the ground. And um, so, so keep in mind, you clearly want a rack that's firmly implanted either into a ground or to the wall. You also want two points of contact with the bicycle. That gives a lot of stability to the bicycle against the rack, and that gives more security opportunities. So, you know, in some cities, uh, wheels go missing and frames stay on the bicycle. And so if you're someone who's really concerned uh, that you have maybe valuable wheels or you just don't want your wheels missing at all, sometimes you'll use two locks. And so not only are you creating more, more um, uh, stability for your bike against the rack, but also it gives you an opportunity to secure more elements uh, of your bicycle. And, um, and another thing, good thing about a, 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 a good bike rack would be uh, security and ease of use, um, that these bike racks make it pretty simple for you to use them. Um, Moving on here. So, you know, what we're trying to really distinguish and drive home, and I'm sure probably everyone on this call would agree, too many bike facilities are afterthoughts. There's not a lot of thought given to them. And we want to really implore people to make very conscious choices about their bike parking facilities, to make sure in the early stages that we're planning for them. Um, and people will notice, you know, uh, people who bike really take note of these these kinds of uh, facilities. They, they know who cares and they know who, who doesn't. You know, when you when I, or I'm sure a lot of people on this call, when you go somewhere and it's obvious that the, the people welcoming you or offering you even bike parking, um, that if it's not if it's not well thought out and it's it's actually, uh, it, it feels kind of unlit or unsafe or just inconvenient, maybe it's tough to pull your bike into the space you just kind of have a negative vibe. They may be providing bike parking, but if it's not sufficient and it's not decent, you almost have an effect like it's worse than if they hadn't provided bike parking at all. So that's why it's so important to really put time and energy and think about the facilities that you're providing and people will appreciate it. There's just no doubt about it. Um, and then, uh, you know, with that in mind, before we even get into um, the, the meat of the presentation, before we even talk about the spaces themselves, I think it's important to just bring up where in the space, where in the building, where in the facility is the bike parking going to go? And like Amelia said, how convenient it is to the other amenities that you're going to offer bicyclists and, and how convenient is it to the entrances to the building? We're going to talk a little bit about more about that, about standards. But when we're thinking about where we're going to place our bike parking, we want it to be street level as much as possible. We want it to be near building entrances and elevators. We want it to feel safe. We want it to be convenient to the building and convenient to use. And we also want it to be welcoming. Look at this great uh, bike parking uh, room in Houston. Uh, like you'd imagine in Texas, they go all out for their bike rooms. This was a massive mural right outside the room. And um, I'll have a picture later in the presentation of what this room like looked like inside. Uh, but this, this is meaningful. This makes you feel welcome. This 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 is encourages people to bicycle entrances like this. Um, so when we talk about long-term facilities, we really talk about um, 
we're thinking about bike rooms and we're thinking about bike stations. Um, and bike rooms are essentially for private, private, you know, entrances. They're usually with, um, you know, it's usually employer offers it to their employees. Bike station starts to get into more public amenities so that there might be some, uh, there might be some pay for spaces that are secure. And then there might be some public spaces, the bike station versus a bike room, which is really very focused on, on just the long-term bike parking. And I'm also adding here, you'll see a couple images very specifically of parking garages, because I think they really are something that could be called out in particular because more and more parking garage operators are gonna play a critical role in bike parking in cities. And there's actually a standard out there uh, similar to lead for bike parking facilities, it's called ParkSmart. And we'll talk a little bit about the standards they've set for ParkSmart and just how uh, car parking operators can contribute greatly to the amount of bike parking that's out there. We'll actually use some of the standards that, that they've set to inform the kind of standards that we'll talk about today. So um, why don't we talk now a little bit about rack types. Travis, let me, let, me, uh, let you take it over from here. Uh, we're going to talk about horizontal, vertical, and two-tier, um, and we'll, we'll break down each one because these are our tools to use for each bike room. And so, um, go ahead, Travis. You want to sure. talk a little bit about uh, horizontal. Start with horizontal. Yeah, definitely. So with um, uh, bicycle parking, one of the things that a lot of people who are not very familiar with bikes tend to kind of gloss over or forget is that bikes are pretty good size. They're almost like five and a half uh, feet long you know, three and a half feet tall, two feet wide by the handlebars. If you're trying to, to sneak that into certain areas, you can imagine you're gonna be running into um, some kind of just limitations of space use. It's not uncommon in the industry for someone to have like a 20 foot by 20 foot area and they're hoping, fingers crossed, to park 60 bikes. So with that, you know, it's just some limitations with it. Um, horizontal is probably the easiest way where, you know, that you basically, you roll the bike in, the bike takes up roughly about six feet. Bikes often tend to park kind of staggered on horizontal racks. And by that, I mean, you roll your bike up, you see on like the inverted U, um, the next bike is coming up, it wants to park on the same one, it might park on that back leg. So there's natural offset. So there's not like the, the ability for congestion with handlebars. Um, in addition to that, with horizontal parking, um, much like if we're talking car parking stalls, you need a little bit of access point to coat and kind of turn into it. If you're talking horizontal, you know, you're talking about six feet, maybe a little bit more with the offshoot, and then you're gonna need at least a four foot aisle in order to pull into it. So that means that you're talking about, you know, 11, 12 feet of space that you would need in order to kind of utilize that inverted view like that. Uh, next up is going vertical. And going vertical is a, a great use of um, space where basically if you uh, pop the wheel on its back leg, it goes from being like six feet to being about 40 inches in length. So that means that, um, so with the aisle, you know, we recommend four foot aisle can shrink down to a three foot aisle. So you're basically um, reducing the amount of uh, floor space, cutting it in half between the two. So a lot of places are going into vertical parking, especially if they're trying to hit a certain capacity. The only thing that's difficult with um, vertical is because it's so condensed, um, it's, it can greatly hit a greater capacity than horizontal. So it's always that kind of give and take in regards to capacity versus um, equity, basically, in regards to the different racks. And that's something that hopefully we can get into more and more with like the, the designers at the, at the ground floor rather than trying to reach a certain capacity at the end of the process. And the other route for increasing capacity is going two tier. Travis, and, just quick before we, uh, before we go to two tier, yeah. what are some of the things that you think really uh, distinguish good vertical bike parking versus sub, subpar vertical bike parking? What are some of the things you'll look for? Definitely. Um, for going vertical, I'd say some of the, the things that are, are great is um, to be able to fit any number of wheel types and sizes. So there are some racks in the in industry where it's a little bit limiting, where it might only fit um, standard like road tires. But once you start getting into fatter mountain bike tires or fat bike tires, um, the rack is no longer um, permissible to hold it. The other thing is to be fender friendly as well. There are some uh, racks in the industry where they um, basically hug the front wheels, it gets lowered into it, which works fine, um, except for if there's a fender. That fender can um, basically cause issues with it and then the fender can get ripped off or damaged quite easily with it. Uh, the other thing is just natural space use as well. Um, it's great to have a bike have its own stall, as you can see. Um, there are some racks in the industry that um, 
try to condense it a little bit more and have two bikes in a certain spot, which is a little bit tricky because just with pedals, um, they stick out. So there's more opportunity for con um, congestion, scraping, or to force the bikes to angle off to make u lock kind of impossible. So there are a lot of different ways. I'd say, you know, apart from that, vertical um, is wall material that we'll get into later. Oh, um, the other thing is like in the center, um, if you have something with a cable, um, just like any other type of rack, you know, a cable, you're only as secure as that cable. So if you can lock directly to the frame with a rack, it's going to be a lot more, a lot more secure. So that's another thing to kind of look out for. Yeah. So you definitely want a rack that's you lock compatible. Um, that would be pretty kind of going from there. Um, you know, it doesn't make sense in all applications, but if you're talking real estate, that's very valuable. If you can't go, always build more, you can build up. So with these ones, you know, you can have, different types of two-tier systems. There's some that are static, which means that it requires the front wheel to go in, then you manually hoist the back wheel up and slide it onto it. And there's other ones that are lift assist. And there are some very big differences in the marketplace between these being static and lift assist. So I'd make sure that if it is static, um, make sure that you're getting something that can sit and hold um, bikes as it goes forward. So that means having wide enough wheel wells to help the bike stay upright as it's going through, so there's no chance of it getting damaged and falling off. And the other thing is with two tier is it's great to find a rack that not only helps lift the bike up, but also helps lift the bike down. So that way it aids in that kind of um, uh, physical exertion if we're talking about um, equity as, as well again. So it's another thing to kind of keep an eye on. With these ones though, you know, you're talking about something that's roughly, roughly about nine feet of vertical space in the marketplace um, for, for vertical. So um, it just kind of depends upon the right room for it. All right. Well, uh, let's talk a little bit about lockers and shelters. I, you know, I'll, I'll speak from my own personal experience. And Travis, I'd love for you to to uh, to add to this as well. But lockers and shelters, um, you know, I my my experience has been is that they're more common on college campuses where there isn't necessarily room uh, to have bikes in a building, and maybe the parking facilities are too far from the campus buildings where. Um, where the maybe administration wants the bike parking, so we'll see a lot of uh, we'll see a lot of uh, maybe lockers on college campuses, and really even employers that have campus type settings. That's where we'll also see lockers. It just really helps bring the bike parking to the place where the people are, because as as all bicyclists know, you know we really don't like like walking too far from where we're parking our bike to where we're going, where our destination is, and that's why uh, a shelter might be a good. A good solution. Where I've mainly seen lockers used is often uh, transit nodes, where you have an area that uh, has a strong commuter bike commuter presence, and they want to make sure that their bike commuters feel that their bikes are going to be secure when they hop onto uh, a metro or a T or something like that. And uh, and so they're they're providing that extra level of security. Um, and so that's where the, these these kinds of features come into play for for long term bike parking. How about you, Travis? How might you uh, you have anything yeah. to add to that? I think for the most part, you hit, you hit the nail on the head. Um, the other thing I'd say is that, um, you know, bicycle parking and good bicycle parking is almost becoming expected in a lot of places as you're moving into it. So, um, you know, it was something that was a perk and now it's becoming more either required by local code or just expected by tenants. So one of the ways to kind of entice um, tenants to get to there is, um, Often if you can't find a place inside, we're seeing more opportunities for lockers and shelters outside as well too at, at places. And one of the spots, if you have um, maybe like an aging property that might have a tennis court, we're starting to see more and more um, places like that where um, tennis courts really aren't quite used as much as they used to be. So we're seeing those kind of maybe taken over by bicycle parking or by um, like playgrounds for, for the youth as well. So it's kind of trying to find other niche ways and make use of available space. Okay, why don't we jump into installation surfaces? You know, we've 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 um, talked about the types of racks. Of course, they have to be installed and they have to be anchored firmly. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, it's not just important to have a good bike rack, but we got to make sure that it's anchored into the ground or into the walls very securely. So, um, concrete, of course, that that is the most stable foundation that there is uh, for bike racks for the most part, and um, and racks can either be actually installed in ground or surface mounted with wedge anchors. Um, and then, you know, with these other surfaces like dirt, mulch, grass, tire, asphalt, and pavers, 
uh, you know, the, there's a racks on rail solution, which you, these can lay right on top of those, but you really can't anchor into the ground on any of these. Even asphalt, we, uh, we try to discourage people from anchoring into asphalt. I mean, there are some situations where it may work, but once you get a really hot day and you've anchored your rack into asphalt, uh, you'll find that there's usually going to be a lot of play to them. You really have to take tremendous precaution and make sure you're using the right product uh, to reinforce that that anchor um, in the asphalt. Uh, and then, and then it, you know, with a really hot day, it may not even work. It would just take tremendous amounts of preparation. Well, you you could really just use a rail system, which we'll have images of as the presentation goes along. Uh, uh, echoing with Lou, um, one of the things with dirt, mulch, and grass um, that we've seen sometimes, it's um, sometimes people have done things like like a giant corkscrew that goes in the ground and anchor it with a chain. Um, that's something that we've seen to, to get a little bit more security or otherwise just for um, visibility is we've seen people um, in mulch basically bury a portion of the bike rack where it doesn't increase security, but it does hide the, the fact that it's on rails. That's something that we've seen. Um, Lose, lose exactly right with asphalt is that you know it's there's different degrees of asphalt and it's malleable it's something that's so malleable that if you install an asphalt and remove it within just a few months the asphalt will actually seal itself back up so it's very very pliable so what it means is that you know if you like you said like you bound it to it there's always a chance that it gets over a certain threshold of heat and if you're leaning on it you'll fall over and the rack will topple with you so that's bad for just um, uh, safety reasons for the individual, and you can imagine what that would might mean for the um, security of the bicycle as, as well. Um, same with pavers. The problem with pavers is, um, you know, you have to have a lot of anchors. So there's, if you can see that illustration right there, there's a lot of corners and um, and um, grout lines or just empty lines. So your chance of getting close to an end to have it shatter is pretty high. And the other thing is, if you're lucky enough to mount directly into the center of it, is it's pretty common, and we've seen a lot of pictures of it. Um, of basically it can topple over and just lift those like four or five bricks with it basically so you, you even though you can get to there it's just a notion of security and safety as well so that's something that we always try pushing for and since we're talking about long-term bike parking i think it's worth uh delving a little bit into the wall surfaces that we uh that we utilize as well for for anchoring bike parking in, in bike rooms and bike stations um, so these are some of the most, really the most common and the most suitable surfaces, the concrete block, poured concrete, wood studs, all of just fine for vertical bike parking. Um, and uh, it just requires a specific kind of anchors to, that, are, that are suitable for those surfaces. You know, I would also mention metal studs is obviously something that's very common in new construction and yet not the best anchor uh, anchoring um, foundation for a bike rack but there are ways around that and i'd like travis to sort of talk about that because it is so common yeah definitely um metal studs brings its own uh kind of issue with it um, metal studs is great if anybody's done construction you know half of your time of building something is trying to find that two by four that's straight um so that's why going metal stud you can avoid that and then also just with fire ratings and everything else so there's a very good reason uh, to go that route. The problem is that um, a metal stud, if you're unfamiliar with it, is about the same thickness as like the back of a spiral notebook. So um, as you can imagine, there's not really a whole lot of ability for it to hold racks. In addition, it provides a lot of vertical support, but not a lot of horizontal support. And it also gains rigidity by having like a sheetrock pressed up against it. So what happens if it breaks that sheetrock, it, it can hire, um, encourage it to have torsion and twist which might kind of impact the, the metal stud later on. So what we'd recommend is, you know, tacking up, um, tacking up plywood basically um, to gain security through it, the mounting to the plywood. Um, and then, you know, we'd recommend if possible to go through with uh, washers and nuts to go on the back of the, the sheet rock or the back of the metal stud in the front. So that way you can make sure to grab it so it doesn't have enough weight to pull it off. But when you do that, um, you know, as we're saying again and again, you know, part of the, the element of um, bike racks is ease of use and security. With that, you know, if you're talking with wood stud or plywood, you're only going to be as secure as wood stud and plywood. So that's just something to consider. Um, just one other aside with metal studs is we often see them built in the center of rooms um, when there's nothing else there. And that can be problematic sometimes the architect doesn't nail the space usage and the other thing that can be a little bit problematic is the other thing is security and safety so um visibility is, is really key for bike rooms as well too so if you're coming in there 
And if you have a clear eye of sight of every single area in the bike room, you can see to make sure that there's no one lurking there, there's no corners to hide. So that just allows for more uh, security and safety, not only for bikes that are in there, but also for any, any user of, of the system as well. Great, so now that we've uh, found our bike racks, all our options, and uh, we know how to anchor them, let's talk about how building a bike room out, uh, and this really is just repeating a lot of what Amelia said, but I think it's worth uh, worth repeating because it really distinguishes and makes a difference between just a kind of an afterthought bike room or bike space and really a showpiece, something that makes people want to ride a bike and makes them feel like they're gonna be supported at work, and they, you know, even to the point maybe Form community there because there's there's elements that are engaging people. Uh, pumps and tools, storage, locker rooms, maps, place for message boards, even you know that aren't online necessarily, but in person. Hey, you you know ride boards and things like that. E-bike charging, wash stations, uh, seating, signage is huge. You know, getting people to that facility once again it gives you an opportunity to give presence to bicycling outside the bike room. Um, and 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 just r remind people, hey, this facility is here. Um, so si signage is a, is a really valuable tool. And um, artwork, artwork in bike rooms is just it's 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 a great opportunity to work with artists and have murals and um, and just lively liven up a space. And even interior designers, I mean, you can take it you can take it to the extremes that you want. But if you're a business that really wants to encourage bicycling. It is worth taking these kind of steps to uh, to just you know I, I I'm you know architects will often you know you know if you ask an architect they pretty much think uh, and I mean this respectfully you know buildings change the world right and 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 places change the world well that go that goes true for bike rooms to some degree as well I'm talking about the individual and it changes people's minds so if we take our bike rooms very serious in our bike parking facilities and we do those extra touches, it really does attract people and it encourages them and gets them excited about it. Here's a, here right here's a, an example of, a, you know, look at this laid out space with a lounge couch, lockers and, and uh, artwork. I mean, this is a, this is a wonderful place. This is, a, this is another element to that bike area, that, I, that bike room that I showed you in Houston a little earlier. They've got a small little kitchenette uh, apart from the bike rooms, all this artwork, maybe that's a map of Houston going on there. So, so we have all these spaces that we're working with, and we thought we thought very specifically about the space where we want to put the bike racks, where we want our bike room or our or our bike parking facility within our parking garage. Let's uh, let's talk about that space a little bit, and, and let's think about it, um, and some of the key questions to ask when we're building out a space and thinking about it. Travis, why don't you take it from here since you have built many a bike room, at least designed them in your day. So um, I'll, I'll start by just saying, these are some basic questions. How many bikes do you need parked? Where's the location of the facility versus the desired destination of people using it? What's your budget? That's so important to understand what your budget is because that immediately helps whoever you're working with know the kind of products that, that, that will be sufficient and work best for you. What kind of security measures are in place? And uh, the space description, what kind of obstruction, doorways, what's the room measurements and ceiling heights? These are all the really fundamental questions that go into a bike room. Uh, go ahead, Travis, if you have anything to add to that, love to hear. Yeah, it's. I think that Lou is pretty much right. Um, you know, the, the additional things I'd say is that usually if you're starting to, to work on a bike room, um, the thing that kind of sets the tone is the requirements in the city. So, um, not all cities have a local code, but um, often they do. So you're always trying to hit like X capacity, um, you know, for horizontal and vertical. So a lot of it, you know, what you're trying to do from, from our end anyways, is trying to hit that capacity and trying to make it be as, um, as opening and inviting as, as usual. Uh, however, um, you know, it kind of gets to have like a, um, a give and take between the issue of cost, the issue of space usage and everything else is try to find that, that right ground. So it's something that, you know, if we're able to get a little bit more space, it's more easy to get stuff on the ground, whereas you start going more condensed, it's kind of limiting to kind of having to go more um, vertical or two tier. So it's a little bit of that kind of give and take and knowing that, you know, it, there might not be always a silver bullet for each individual project. But, you know, if you're working with um, a, a good company and a good, um, a good architect, you know, hopefully you can find a, one that can be just kind of perfect for the location at hand. 
so here's a great example of of uh, like a, a bike a bike room or a bike space within a parking garage that's been laid out without thinking about bicycles and we just want to illustrate this to show you okay yeah that looks that looks fine look at look it's got you know maybe space for about 16 bicycles there really using utilizing this corner in the parking garage that they can't park cars in so what's that look like once we get bikes parked in it it looks kind of like this <laughs> and, and you just so often we we run into this where you just aren't going to be able to fit the capacity that you intend. So you really have to remember to put those bikes in, into the into the drawing, into the layout. Let's have a quick look at, once again, I know Travis mentioned this, but um, this is how much space bikes take up. And that's something we have to think about when we're designing and thinking about space for bike rooms. Um, and you want room to move. Um, you know, single aisles, the simplest layout like you see here. Ultimately, you want to, if you can, employ a mix of bike parking types because you you know, horizontal bike parking is ultimately the best. It's the easiest, but when we run out of space, sometimes we have to we have to sort of use vertical and two-tiered parking. So we want at least some horizontal bike parking in our bike rooms. Um, and then, you know, if if your budget's not large but your space is, you know, plan for the future and work from a design that can be scaled. Uh, and also, how are you going to fit the amenities into the space? Because that that sometimes is a game changer uh, and really makes like we already said, the, the space more inviting and encouraging. Um, and you always want to look for um, anything like um, post-tension cables in the floor, so you avoid uh, drilling into those, or if you have to drill into post-tension cables from the construction of the floor, that you're using the appropriate anchors for that. And then you always want to be aware of HVAC and, and um, you know the, the different elements in, in the space. Uh, actually, Travis, I'm going to go to this next because this is a bike room that you put together as a sample layout. Why don't you delve into this a little bit for us and tell us why this makes such a, a good bike room? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, with this one, it's it's showing um, all surface mount. And from, from our standpoint anyways, we, we do prefer surface mount rather than wall mount. And um, we mentioned a little bit in regards to um, uh, wall material, which is something that's key. The other thing is that with... Um, that with wall mount that you never really see on architectural drawings is um, bike racks are often the last thing to get installed and we're installed after plumbing or electrician. So what happens is that if somebody runs like a, um, a conduit up from bottom to floor, if it's wall mount and it's being continuous from left to right, that can cause an issue. Whereas if it's floor mount, you can just nudge it off the wall an inch basically. So it's ways that it's a little bit easier to kind of use with the space. So here you see kind of, um, Aisles are, are great and booming. They're about 60 inches, about five feet for aisles. So you have the mix of um, um, Ultra Space Saver Squared up on top, which is vertical system. The orange ones are a two-tiered static system. That's the, the Darrow Duplex. Um, outside the room, you see those little blue rectangles. That is uh, um, some lockers. And then also right kind of in the bottom right-hand corner of the room, what you have is um, some hoop racks that are, are more for um, say bikes that would require more of an ADA space or bikes that are of unusual shape. And uh, Lou kind of hit the, um, call it out a little bit before that bikes tend to park wherever it's easiest. I always refer to bike parking kind of as, um, it's kind of like water, it follows the path of least resistance. So um, in regards to adding like a little bit of paint to the walls, one of the things that we would recommend for these type of applications is to really designate, like paint something on the ground there to, to explain kind of what those set aside racks are for just so that the average person is coming in through the door doesn't immediately pull and put their bike in there. Uh, the other thing that you can see is that the, the figure right next to the, um, kind of in the center of the room is working on their bike and that's a, a, a bicycle repair stand that's kind of in the immediate access so it's highly visible but it's not in a way that's in a thoroughfare that would block um, any of the access points. Yeah, and the key here is ample space. This room does not just squeeze things in to, to minimums. This really uh, affords a maximum and that really lends itself to the space and makes a user feel very comfortable in that space and uh you know we don't like we don't like well i was going to say we don't like squeezing in our car our, our drivers but we squeeze in our drivers too i mean that's just how it is sometimes but we we want to give uh we want to give a shout out to our bicyclists so we want to give them more space to get more people to do it uh speaking of which we want to consider all users we we we've, we've all brought up a little bit today about um there's different people who are comfortable on different bikes. You see things like trikes are come, becoming more common and that allows people that aren't necessarily uh, 
comfortable on two wheels to go to three wheels or recumbent riders um and and also even people with uh, uh physical challenges now have bikes that they can use and so we want to we want to talk a little bit about ADA and bike rooms now and how 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 it how some practical uh, tips for addressing this first we'll start with um there's 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 really several ways that we approach thinking about ADA American Dis Disabilities Act and bike rooms and bike facilities the first is is really addressing um the vulnerable folks who aren't necessarily riding at all but might have vision impairment and we don't want them to to get whacked by some bike parking facility some some uh bike maintenance stand or some bike rack in the street so how do we think about these things to make sure that uh they're not vulnerable what kind of steps do we have to take to make sure they're not vulnerable to facilities either in a building or even on the street so the first thing i'll review here is something called the, the um the post mounted objects and so uh, if we can if we can visualize these examples as bike parking facilities or 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 bike maintenance facilities, let's take um, the figure on the furthest left. That could easily be a bike a bike uh, maintenance facility with the uh, the single anchor point, the pole going up, and then the arms extending about 12 inches. How do we make sure that that doesn't become a hazard for someone walking by those? hanger arms walking by or if you take that middle example we can easily we can easily equate that with some sort of type of u rack right and so how do we make sure that that doesn't suddenly become a hazard for someone who's visually impaired in both those cases there's uh the the, the bottom 27 inches is considered the cane sweep and so if there's not an indication that something is there and that that there's instead something that's above 27 inches without any indication below 27 inches, then that can become uh, that can become a hazard for someone. And so, like I said, I, one of the best examples we have, if you can imagine a, um, a, um, a bike maintenance facility and the hangar arms coming over, what are some of the things that you might be able to do? Well, for one, you can see they can only be 12 inches max from the, uh, from the anchor point itself. And so if it's anything more than 12, it's considered a hazard. So you're gonna have to put something beneath those hangers to make sure that the cane sweep can be can 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 recognize that it's there if it's a bike rack you if if the um if the upper limit of the bike rack if the uh if the curve of the bike rack is higher than 27 inches then you can put what we call a lean bar beneath the 27 inches and that puts a lean bar into uh the cane sweep and that helps indicate that there's a bike rack there so those are some things we can do with post-mounted objects. As far as uh, you know, like wall hanging racks, you can imagine you know vertical bike racks posted against a wall. Uh, if you take if you take this green area here here on the side, if that was a uh, if that was a vertical bike rack mounted against this wall, and there wasn't anything beneath in the cane sweep, you can see how that would be a hazard. And so. If that's the case, you have to put something in the cane sweep, some type of panel, to indicate that there are some bike racks and coming coming ahead in this in this in this particular row. You always want to avoid, you know, you want to avoid anyone with visual impairments in the first place walking into spaces like this. Um, and so, in the event that they have to or they might, these are the kinds of measures that that you can you can put into place. These kinds of panels, like you see here on the right hand side, this panel here would be something that would be in the cane sweep and would indicate to someone that there's something overhead, there's something perhaps in that vulnerability area uh, that's above the cane sweep. So if we look at a if we look at a bike room, um, what might what might an ADA compliant bike room look like? Not much different in some ways um, than the one Travis showed, but of course Travis Travis's bike room was the ideal bike room because you had plenty of space in the aisles um, and for for other folks to use the bike room. But unlike someone maybe with visual impairment, but someone who was actually using a bike who had a physical uh, challenge, but had a bike that was geared towards them, they could actually enter this bike room quite easily. The uh, closest bike racks to the door were well spaced apart, and as you can see here. Faintly, you can see wheelchairs in those spaces, and there's plenty of space between each bike racks 
Um, in fact, there's uh, 60 inch inches between each each actually perceived wheelchair in this space. So what's that done? It's given us three horizontal racks, very close to the entrance. The person with such a bike doesn't have to mess with any of the vertical bike parking in the other part of the room. And then they can easily gain access to the room, the bike parking, and also leave the room. And so this would be a, a good example of an ADA compliant bike room for someone who had a bike that was maybe you know not not uh, not typically sized. So those are sort of some ADA uh, standards and thoughts to, to think about. Travis, I don't know if you had, had anything to add to that. I think that you covered most of it. Um, I think that part of it is true is, is that um, it's going to get a little bit complicated as we get more and more different types of bikes. It becomes a little bit of a, um, a juggling act um, for our side and for designers as well because there's what is typically known as like the standard bicycle accounts for the vast majority but it's trying to find ways to you know um, allow space usage for the trikes for the the um, cargo bikes for the uh, the recumbents and like all that stuff um, has a very different lengths widths and turning radiuses so that's just something to always kind of keep on the the side of trying to allow rooms to have access to that as well yeah so why don't we delve a little bit into uh, some of the different standards that are out there just to help inform us about what what our organization is looking for for quality bike parking. And you're, many of you are probably familiar with LEED. Of course, that's been around a while and it's administered by the Green Business Certification um, Incorporated. They actually certify businesses to be both uh, parking garages to be park smart or LEED certified. USGBC is actually uh, the one who creates the standards and GBCI is the one who uh, is the third party that qualifies whether or not you've, you've reached the standard. But, um, you know, in terms of bike parking facilities, you want them to be within, you know, Lee tells us you want it to be within 200 yards of a bike network. You might want to create the best bike room that's out there, but if you're not within 200 yards of a great bike network, um, uh, or three miles and, two, and, and 200 yards of proximity and within three miles of diverse uses and employment centers and transit stops. Uh, you know, it's, is it really worth having a bike room? Um, I mean, maybe it is and that, you know, applies to you, but you really need to make sure your, your business is located on a network. And that's important for a lead point. In order to get that lead point, you want to make sure you're located close to a bicycle network that leads you to employment centers and transit stops. You want to make sure, according to LEED, that parking is decoupled from car parking. There shouldn't be, you know, there, when, you, when you're creating a bike parking facility, you want to make sure that you're not tying it to the amount of car parking that's there. That's a, that's a good standard to go by, even, some or, even though so, some ordinances try to couple uh, bike parking and car parking. Good, good guidelines are make it its own thing. Don't, don't couple with car parking. Uh, LEED also offers points for shower and changing facilities. They have short-term and long-term bike parking specific stipulations. So there's, there's things that are very specific about short-term bike parking and other things that are uh, specific about long-term bike parking. For example, what entrances to a building? Uh, long-term bike parking, it isn't so concerned that it's the main entrance, it just has to be a, ma uh, a entrance to the building, where short-term bike parking has to be a main entrance to the building. It has to be within 100 yards. Um, or 100 feet, sorry about that, 100 feet. And then, you know, LEED also uh, quantifies and gives points for a bicycle, bicycle maintenance program for employees or bicycle route assistance, uh, especially for uh, retail buildings. These are the kinds of things that uh, they think about and some of the things that you could possibly think about when creating a long-term bike parking facility. Also, LEED breaks it down into category specific as you'll find some ordinances do that too. Different bike parking requirements are for retail and healthcare, schools, commercial, institutional, and residential facilities. They all, when, when you get some bike parking ordinances and lead, for example, that gets very specific and detailed about that, the bike parking requirements become a little different. And so when you're building your own facility, those are the kinds of things that you might want to pay attention to. Um, for Park Smart, um, there's two criteria. One is uh, you earn it if you get everything. And then for criteria two, which gives you more points, it's run much like lead where you use certain categories like bronze, silver, and gold. Uh, if you want to get that, that second tier, you have to not get every quality, but some of, some of the uh, aspects 
that are suggested in their requirements. So I'll just I'll gloss over some of them, but they demand that an area is sufficiently lit. You know, that's something that's overlooked frequently. Make sure your bike parking facility is sufficiently lit and the path that gets there is well lit. Um, also, make sure it's the same grade. We talked about that. Try to make it the same grade on the first floor as the entrance to the building. You really don't want people going up into elevators or up steps. Um, sometimes that's unavoidable. And if you're going to have people go up some flights of steps, there are some products out there, ramps, that allow people to, to actually glide their bike up the steps as you walk it through. Um, and then there's a requirement for a certain amount of covered uh, bike parking as well. Covered bike parking, as we said, is extremely important for long-term bike parking. Um, for criteria two, to get those extra points for this category, they put a lot of emphasis on signage, storage lockers, tools, having tools available, um, at least two spaces available for cargo bikes and uniquely shaped bicycle. Once again, we're seeing that we're seeing that in different standards that we're talking about having those 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 basic bike racks available for any kind of user, no matter what their bike is or whatever their challenges might be. We're just going to emphasize that over and over again because it's so important. Also, having security measures in place is another thing that will get people extra points for uh, Park Smart. You know, whether that's cameras or a security person on, on staff, these are the kinds of things that add to the amenity, making and give people confidence that it's secure, that they're able to be locked. Um, and then, um, you know, and then ordinances, what kind of things do we look at in ordinances? If, you know, sometimes ordinances can be our best friends and, and, and turning to them for proper guides is, uh, is, is valuable. Um, and uh, they provide layout standards for us. And, you know, it has to, it depends on the area where you're from and you have to be, be certain to check in with them and they should be able to give you guide. And if, and if, and if you think their guide is kind of uh, not stringent enough because it's very loose and it's very light on the requirement, then turn to other ordinances, turn to other, other uh, you know, other cities or the lead standards to help guide you for these, this kind of information. Travis, do you have anything to add about just dealing with ordinances and working with ordinances? Yeah, it's, some of it can get a little tricky. Um, there's there's a fair amount of them that are getting updated because um, a lot of the cities had originally wrote um, bicycle ordinances um, quite some time ago before vertical and two-tier parking. So a lot of that is trying to get those to kind of get updated to know that space usage is different, whereas if it's on the ground, you know, you require X number of, of um, feet in between bikes. But if you're talking about stuff that's staggered or two tier, it's trying to kind of get that stuff updated. So that's something that we're working with often with cities or with individuals working with cities to try to help out. Um, the other thing is sometimes cities just have bike boxes, which is regardless of product, they just call like a, a horizontal bike is six feet by two feet and a vertical um, bike rack is um, uh, a three feet by two feet. So some of that is true and not true, um, or technically that is, but once again, because of that staggering and everything else, um, there's a little bit more give and take with some of this. So some of that, just be prepared that there might be a little bit of conflict or need to be education at the local level. And if that is the case, if it's at all beneficial, um, there's agencies and organizations that are able to help to kind of, um, to kind of, um, uh, let people know kind of what the situation is and Darrow is one of those that'd be more than happy to kind of help jump into any conversation. Yeah so in, in review I think it's also worth we've all talked about these but let's just real quickly not enough parking options these are the common pitfalls not enough aisle space insufficient lighting and poor access try to avoid these these are things we see time and again and things to keep in mind. Um, when you're dealing with vendors, it's really important to trust your vendors that you're dealing with with your bike parking. How well are vendors able to provide guidance about their products and the choices associated with them? What are the warranty terms? How do they control their manufacturing? What kind of value added services like CAD layouts and access to common file types, the products that you can easily upload or architects that you're working with can easily upload? Do they make those easily available? Um, do the people designing and selling the bike racks actually use bikes for transportation? Um, and then do they have videos to demonstrate how some of the more complex bicycle systems function? Those are all valuable to have, and these are the kinds of things that you could look out when you're choosing a vendor. Uh, here's some quick uh, just pilot projects that were out there. This is Pont City Market in Atlanta, Georgia. This is along the Atlanta Beltline. It's a mixed-use development. It employed a lot of horizontal and vertical bike parking for long-term. 
And um, they also had a public bike valet. It was a huge investment and the Beltline has transformed um, Atlanta. Uh, so much so that uh, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the thing that's come out of it is the gentrification's been a problem from it. I won't get into that here, that's not this presentation, but it's been incredibly success successful and it's encouraged a lot of people in the Atlanta region and the city specifically to start biking more. And this was a big principal development in that area. And they, they went well beyond the city's uh, requirements. This developer came in and they knew what they were, they knew what they were doing. Uh, and they provided a tremendous amount of bike parking. There's, this, there's some developers and other spot, spots too that are getting uh, um, allowances. So there might be um, like a big condo units that don't actually have any um, car parking. That's something that we've seen kind of just begin to pop up in different areas too. So depending upon the region, it might even make sense to go the extreme opposite, you know, if it's next yeah. to like a light rail hub or something. Yeah. Uh, here's an example of a before and after bike room project that was done here in Pittsburgh, where I'm located. You can see the difference in this space. I mean, there was just, right, let's throw some bike racks in here and then let's actually make an investment and encourage people. We, we, we lighten it up with some bright colors, put some vertical and horizontal, some, some bike maintenance facilities, and it makes a world of difference. Here's another example of that. On the side of a historical building, actually, the owner was willing to put a mural that promoted bike parking. And we created a long-term bike parking facility here that offers both a bike station, it's a repurp repurposed shipping container for the long-term leased bike parking. And then off to the side on the right-hand corner, you see there the bottom corner, there's some, uh, there's some shelter because it's under a shelter, long-term uh, bike parking uh, for just really anyone to use, open to the public. And you can see how these colors and everything make such a big difference to these spaces. Uh, looking to the future, uh, these are examples in Asia and Europe, but you can see the amount of investment um, that happens in, 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 in across, across the oceans and across the world. Um, we know that they're, they're making, although we're, we're, we're catching up in some ways, but the, the level of investment we're seeing uh, in different parts of the world is uh, really the U.S. pales in comparison to what we're seeing. And so what are the, some of the things that are happening? Uh, innovations in security, including technology integration. Uh, we're seeing more and more of that in the U.S. where, uh, you know, whether that's RFID tags using radio frequency or Bluetooth to be able to get in the lockers, uh, increasing the density but not decreasing the discomfort of getting into those spaces, just allocating more real estate to facilities. Uh, and then, and then more standalone bike stations. You know, we're not we're not seeing that as much in the U.S. We do see it periodically, but that that's something we think is going to happen more and more in the United States. Just bike parking facilities that aren't tagged with anything else that are just specific to bike parking. Uh, and then we're going to have to see increasingly more and more solutions for dockless bike sharing e-bikes. That's just starting, and uh, we're starting to see more and more innovations in the marketplace for that. Uh, yeah, and um, in terms of resources, uh, these are some these are some things that we turn to: bicycles at rest, um, the APBP guide, Dara's bike parking guide. We have a bike room design guide too. Feel free to ask us for it; we'll be happy to share it with you. Um, and then, just as two examples, the San Francisco uh, ordinance for bike parking and both the Pittsburgh ordinance for bike parking, both very effective but extremely different. San Francisco is very stringent, very, very, uh, uh, very harsh with the, the, uh, the stick. You know, the requirements are very high. And in Pittsburgh, what we've done is uh, we've, we've made the requirements not so high, but we've given a lot of incentives. So heavy on the carrot. And that was transformative. People are ready to make the changes. And so bike parking offsets, what they've done with affordable housing developers and, um, in certain developments, they've given up some of their car parking to incorporate more bike parking, and it's allowed them to save a lot of money in the development and actually provide more car uh, bike parking. Um, and that's something that uh, developers have been encouraged by and have, have enabled them to actually create more units in some cases. Um, but that's uh, pretty much the presentation in general. We'd love to take some questions and hear from you all. Um, so thanks so much for joining us. Thanks to the league for for being our partner. We've been partners there for years and we really admire their work and we know how important it is and how they push the envelope in so many levels through their programming and their, their work on Capitol Hill and with all the advocacy groups out there. I was an advocacy myself and uh, I know firsthand very much 
the huge role the uh, league plays in, in, in all of our all of our work. So thanks again, Amelia, and the league as well. And uh, we'll open it up now to questions. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks so much, Lou. And I, I recognize we're actually at the hour, but if, if folks want to stay on um, for us to answer some questions, I know I'm I'm available to stay. So if attendees need to drop off, feel free, but the recording will keep going and we'll try to answer some of the questions if Lou and Travis, if you guys are available for that. Um, so I can read these out loud because I know attendees can't see the questions, but thanks to everybody who's been typing in questions. Um, and uh, if it's okay for me to just jump in and do that, um, I'll start at the top. So um, going back to the different uh, bike rack styles, um, do paneers work uh, with vertical racks? That was a question we got early on. Yep. Any advice on um, things that work better they, than others <laughs> for thinking yeah, about people um, with, with uh, Paneers and bags works well with um, uh, vertical systems. The only catch would be is to, um, there's some that try to park um, bikes really compact with vertical systems. Um, so the ones that might have to try, that try to park two bikes on one single arm, um, there's possibly repercussions of that with pedals and paneers would further exasperate that issue. But if it's more like isolated with a one bike on one post, then it's, um, yeah, there's, there's plenty of room. Um, I used to ride all the time with paneers and bags of mine. And the only catch is more um, making sure your bike, your your bag is okay to be flipped sideways and held upright, but making sure it's safe and secure for the contents inside. I say that's probably the yeah. biggest the biggest change with it. Mm -hmm. nice. And then I know we talked about e-charging facilities, but um, what do you recommend for e-bikes in terms of their weight uh, and what kinds of racks are best? Um, somebody noted they're seeing a trend towards more and more e-bikes in their apartment buildings. At, at Adero, uh, we used to have some e-bikes that the staff would use, and apart from that, um, you know, we, we utilized almost vertical uh, exclusively at our work just because that was um, a bit horizontal as well that we used for if somebody had like a cargo bike where if somebody would pull occasionally their dog to work, they would use that, but the rest of us would use the vertical systems. And that's something that um, all of our staff would use. With uh, e-bikes, it, it it was a little bit more kind of a line drawn in the sand where some some people were able to, to use the vertical with e-bikes but it is a, a much heavier hoist it's roughly about um you know almost double the amount of weight as like a normal bike so with that you know um i think that if e-bikes becoming more standard it might be time to to try going to the route of having more um horizontal whether that is just kind of exclusive ones like inverted u's or possibly ones that are two tiered to have then access to the upper one um and kind of keep that Keep that kind of maximum space capacity that you had with the vertical. Um, and then what about racks for balance bikes and smaller children's bikes? Storage for balance bike fleets at preschools and elementary schools can be problematic. What do you advise there? Sure, for, for that and um, it, it, security is not usually like the drawing factor. There's a couple of ones that you tend to see at uh, schools that I probably wouldn't recommend, um, and that's the older style grid rack one, um, which is known in the industry as kind of a wheel bender. And that only provides one point of contact, which means that you put in your front wheel, and then it can possibly, the bike falls over and it can tackle the front wheel, so it's unusable. Um, the other one is like the rolling rack one, which is that serpentine style, which just has one point of contact at, as well, which is better than the grid rack, but in, it still might encourage bikes to kind of topple over. So one of the things that we would recommend um, for ourselves anyways at Darrow is we have a, a U-locket, which is um, kind of a, a lighter gauge inverted U on like a, a, a modular rail channy. And what happens there is because of it's an inverted U, there's two points of contact, which allows the bikes to be held up um, quite easily. But there's one thing with kids is you want to try to um, encourage that because, um, you know, kids are often just kind of throwing their bikes up there. It's trying to make sure that they stay upright. So any type of rack that you have to encourage that is probably the main driving factor of it. It's something with the two points of contact that's smaller, that's easy enough to use with it. So you don't want anything that's too congested and nothing that um, just has that one point to allow things to kind of topple over. Great. Um, can you provide any resources for outdoor awning type coverage spaces? Are there any links that we can put in the chat box um, related to that? Yeah, there's, um, I'm not as familiar with that because it's kind of outside my, my spot at Darrow, but um, we're part of the Play Core organization. And I believe that there's one called Polygon that, that specializes in it. And Polygon, 
Um, I just made a link right there. They do more awnings as well as kind of outdoor structures and a lot of what they do is more customizable. Um, so oh. I know with, with our experience, you know, we've done shelters, it's kind of individual shelters, but with um, the awning ones, it, you might have to get more working with business, uh, building codes and architects just because if you're anchoring into um, a structure, it might provide more, you know, more loads that could affect the walls next to the building as well, or, or more kind of slope to encourage drain possibly to go towards the building. So those are some some things mm -hmm. to kind of keep in mind. But um, that's a little bit outside of my area. But there are there are places that are more much more experienced than myself. You you know something else is you can you can locally find um, um, just builders and 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 even I know uh, locally I've seen a lot of shelters done really craftily and 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 not very complicated that uh that are you know diy almost but obviously meeting code and, and doing it the right way so uh you know you don't necessarily have to get it out of a catalog you can find someone locally to put something together for you um looking through the questions we have a lot of questions that are actually about short-term bike parking so i'm gonna just put a pin in all of those and give everyone a save the date of november 9th we're going to do another webinar with zero on um, short-term bike parking and all the considerations there. So thanks to everybody who submitted questions about things like bike corrals and transit stations and um, those kinds of things. I, I hope that we can address some of those concerns at that webinar. And if it is more sort of long-term bike parking related, we might need to follow up with a few of you via email since we are um, going over time. I did want to just ask two more questions. So one is um, somebody asked about a, a general rule of thumb about estimating how much it costs to build a bike room, if there are any um, sort of pointers you have for something like a 20 by 20 room with wall hanging racks, regular U racks, um, and an ADA compliant and preferred racks. Um, can, do you have a, a ballpark estimate for sort of the standard bike room estimated budget? That, that can depend a lot upon the, the location and uh, even door placement can possibly play a role with it as well. Um, there's also um, with delivery, there's sometimes that um, you might be limited by um, product type in regards to delivery because there's some items that might require um, a forklift for delivery. So um, if it's underneath six foot, you can lower it with a lift gate. If it's above, then it kind of gets more tricky. Let's just say if it's 20 foot by 20 feet, and this is talking just kind of in my head right now, um, I'm pretty sure you could do a run of 14 ultra or vertical on one side, 14 on the other, and maybe like, um, Four hoops for eight racks and the eight bikes in the center, and maybe clock in at maybe around five grand with delivery. So it kind of depends, but it's going to fluctuate a lot. Like your cost for um, horizontal is roughly about half the cost of vertical, and your cost for two tier is about twice that of vertical. So there's going to be give and take um, regarding it in, in regards to trying to find the happy medium with capacity, space use function, and all that. Yeah, I, I think five to seven grand is a good, good estimate, Travis. But remember, you can come in well under that too, and you can build for the future, like we mentioned. So you can do it in pieces. Great, thank you. All right, and then the last question I wanted to take a stab at, um, somebody asked about having a, a, a building manager that is not so bike friendly and how to convince them that they should build a bike room. Um, and I wanted to give another pitch to the Bicycle Friendly Business Program to look at some of the ideas in there, um, especially around building events and culture that maybe could be more grassroots, um, you know, organizing a staff ride to show the building manager how many people might bike to work if they had a bike room by doing something like a fun, you know, lunchtime bike ride using bike share or um, bringing in a local bike shop to do a fix the flat workshop or, you know, some something that's sort of educational encouragement related, um, a bike to work day breakfast for that one day a year with maybe valet parking to show how many people would use it. Um, and those kinds of things that can really, you know, build um, the, you know, morale and the culture around bicycling as a business can double as a way to say, hey, look, we have so many people who are interested. Um, and then also trying out something like a building survey um, to show, you know, to, to ask people whether or not they would bike and what barriers are preventing them from biking and being able to present that to the building manager to, to say, um, to try to make the case. And there are a lot of really good resources on our website um, to sort of show and make the case that, you know, becoming more bicycle friendly has so many returns on the investment, um, whether it's the environment or health or cost savings, um, thinking about how many more people can access the building or the business 
<laughs> everyone's arriving by bike compared to relying, you know, everybody arriving by car, you can fit so many more bikes in the same space. Um, so those are the kinds of arguments I like to make. And, and I hope you could use the um, Bicycle Friendly Business website to find some resources that help. Um, I don't know if you all have anything to add to that. I'm convincing people to um, build bike rooms if their building manager isn't supportive of it. Uh, homemade cookies as well. You can't be <laughs> very personal to throw in there with all your, uh, with with all the other great um, sort of reasons to do it. But kindness helps, and and really trying to get them um, for on a personal level, you know, and 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 mm -hmm. and, and have a relationship with them. And it, it may take some time, but I think eventually you uh, you can win them over. If yeah. it's um, yeah. um, if it's a place of employment too, I mean. It depends. Um, some people are won over by different things. Kindness, I think, is going to go the furthest, but there's also tons of research about regarding productivity for those who ride bikes compared to those who drive in. So if you want to go that route, um, you know, there's tons of tons of examples that are out, out in the industry. There's also, you know, let's say if you're moving to an area and if you're hiring more people and there's not enough um, car parking, which does happen in a fair amount of businesses, you can encourage to kind of switch that way. If you're talking about a property manager for like a residential area, you know, it's, it's, and if, you, if you're talking about trying to have like the biggest ROI for your apartment complex compared to another one, especially trying to encourage um, more younger tenants, like bicycle parking is definitely the way to go. Especially you can build out a bike room basically for the cost of one car parking stall to build it. So it's, it's a pretty great mm -hmm. low hanging fruit to go after. Yeah. And what's the competition doing in the area? Like, what what are some of the businesses that are most most competitive with them? You know, and I'm sure you'll find some examples of people that have taken their bike parking pretty, pretty serious. Yep, there's lots of. If you're looking for a new place to stay, um, you're seeing more and more. You know, great pictures, vanity pictures of the bike rooms. That's the way to try to entice. So once again, you know, a coat of paint in the bike room makes a huge difference. And then, you know, if, if you're trying to encourage your person there, it's just like it's the lowest hanging fruit to possibly encourage people to go there and stay and to not haul their bikes up and cause possibly property damage on the way there and in their own place. <laughs> cool. Okay. With that, if we didn't get to your question, um, we'll either try to follow up via email with you um, or we'll try to address it in the short term bike parking web uh, webinar that we'll be hosting together on November 9th. So again, mark your calendar and keep an eye out for a registration link in the, in the coming weeks. Um, but I want to thank everybody who stayed on with us, especially staying on long, everybody who's watching the um, recording later, and a huge thank you to Lou and Travis and to Sarah, who's behind the scenes um, running the webinar today. This was a lot of really great information, and we're excited to make it available to everybody um, to create better bike parking rooms and make more um, bicycle-friendly places everywhere. So thanks again. I don't know if you guys have any closing remarks, but um, I'll, I'll otherwise sign off and say thanks. Thanks again. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Take everyone. Care. Enjoy the rest of your Bye day. Bye-bye.